Hello Internet. This is the fourth part in our series about the algebra of the free boson. And this part is about left and right moving modes. You can find links to the previous parts in the description below. Let's first talk about why we might want to spend a lot of time familiarizing ourselves with the modes of the field. Well, the modes make it easier to understand the classical behavior of the field, but that's not really the point. What is much more interesting to us is that we will see that in the quantum theory of the field, the modes become exactly the objects that annihilate and create particles of known momentum and energy. And these will be easy to make mathematically precise. In contrast to that, the field turns out to be kind of the object that annihilates or creates particles at a particular space-time point. But this relation has a lot more scare quotes around it because it's mathematically much more difficult to make precise. Therefore, becoming really familiar with the field modes will make it much easier for us to understand the quantum theory of the field. And actually, most of the calculations that we do with the classical mode will carry over one-to-one -to, -one to the quantum theory. What makes the quantum field so much more difficult to work with than its classical counterpart? Well, an attentive viewer has already noted a crucial point in one of our previous episodes, namely that so far we neglected to talk about the convergence of the Fourier series we have been manipulating. It turns out that in the classical theory, uh, we can consistently assume that the Fourier series are perfectly convergent and the field turns out to be a well-behaved function of space and time. This is not the case in the quantum theory. We will see that in general the Fourier series of modes in the quantum theory does not converge in a straightforward way to something that is well-behaved as a function of space and time. This is the reason that the mathematical theory of the vertex algebra is built up using objects that correspond to the modes of the field we are talking about. And the field operators themselves only enter in the form of formal power series, which are not required to converge analytically to well-defined functions. But before we get there, let's first proceed by looking at the modes that we discussed in previous episodes. In these previous parts, we first moved from the definition of our field in space-time to the real-valued Fourier modes, which gave us a great simplification in the description of the classical dynamics, which for the field are given by a linear partial differential equation, and for the Fourier modes are given by an infinite list of decoupled ordinary differential equations. So the modes of the field all behave independently from each other. The real valued Fourier modes correspond to standing wave oscillations of the field, like the ones which are shown in the example here. Here we see the second cosine mode and the second sine mode of the field. And recall that we defined our space dimension to be periodic. So the points in space-time on this line here should be thought as identified with the points in space-time over here. In the next step, we move to the phase space picture of the Hamiltonian formalism, which gave us the conjugate momentum variables. We found that the classical behavior of the modes corresponds to a very simple circular motion in phase space. And by regarding the phase space of each mode as a copy of the complex plane, we could define complex valued mode variables lowercase a. As long as certain reality conditions hold for these complex variables, these variables describe the same oscillations as the real Fourier modes. And in this case, the squared norm of the complex variable corresponds to the energy stored in this mode. 
and it turns out to be constant. That's why we have uh, this circular motion with constant radius. The argument of the complex variable corresponds to the phase of the oscillation. In, and we can use this to very simply uh, manipulate the relative phases of oscillation. Here we see an example where the cosine and the sine mode are exactly equal in phase. But we can also look at an example where they are offset in phase by multiplying uh, the complex variable by the imaginary unit i. And we see that such a multiplication by i corresponds to a phase shift of 90 degrees. In this case, the sine mode is retarded by 90 degrees in phase relative to the cosine mode. Something very nice happens when we add these phase shifted oscillations together, namely the, the sum of these two oscillations turns out to be a wave moving to the right. This leads us to the definition of the right moving modes or right movers. They are represented by complex valued variables lowercase a indexed by both positive and negative integers and they are defined as these linear combinations of our cosine and sine modes. The normalization we have here is chosen such that the Hamiltonian in the new variables will have an equally nice form as that in the cosine and sine modes, as we will soon see. If the cosine and sine modes are, as in our example before, we find that the classical motion of the right moving mode A sub 2 is also described as a circular motion with uniform angular velocity in phase space. And given that the appropriate reality condition holds, this motion corresponds to the moving wave we see in this graph. Note that if we take the cosine and sine modes to have absolute value 1, we find that the right moving mode has absolute value square root of 2. This reflects the fact that the energy stored in this right moving wave is the combined energy of this cosine and this sine mode. Accordingly, the squared norm of our right moving mode is twice as large as the squared norm of each of the individual sine and cosine modes. We got our right moving wave by combining a cosine and the sine mode with the sine mode being retarded in phase by 90 degrees relative to the cosine mode. So let's now look at the opposite situation. We define our sine mode to be advanced in phase by 90 degrees relative to the cosine mode. If we add the corresponding oscillations, we get a left moving wave and we also see that the right moving mode variable a sub 2 that we defined earlier comes out as a constant zero in this case. To describe contributions like these, we define a second set of variables representing the left moving modes or left movers. We call them a bar. They are also indexed by positive and negative integers and are defined as these linear combinations which only differ in the relative signs used compared to the right moving modes. In our example with the left moving wave where our right moving mode variable was a constant zero, we see that the corresponding left moving mode again 
in the classical case has this circular motion in phase space. Last time we also discussed the reality conditions that must hold for our complex valued cosine and sine modes in order to make the variables describing our field real valued. For the right moving and left moving modes we find that if these conditions hold simultaneously we get that the right movers and left movers satisfy very similar forms of reality conditions namely that a minus k equals the complex conjugate of a k for all k in the natural numbers which is by the way also understood here on this side and for the left movers we find that a bar of minus k equals the complex conjugate of a bar k again for all natural numbers k and you can easily check this by seeing that we get from here to here by simply complex conjugating every piece of the definition so we complex conjugate a cos k to a cos minus k because we assume that this reality condition holds we complex conjugate the minus i to plus i and we complex conjugate a sine k to a sine negative k. As you can easily check by inverting these definitions the converse is also true that if the right movers and left movers satisfy these reality conditions for all natural numbers k then also the reality conditions for our cosine and sine mode holds for all k and therefore the variables describing our field will be real valued. Let's now express our Hamiltonian function in terms of the left and right movers. I have copied here the classical Hamiltonian that we derived last time and now we just need to plug in the inverted definitions if we take the definitions of right moving modes and left moving modes we can easily invert these by adding and subtracting the corresponding equations and what we get are these inverted definitions here so let's simply plug these into the Hamiltonian again nothing will change for the zero mode And for a cos minus k times a cos k, we get overall a factor of one half from multiplying these two. And then we have the following terms. So we have a minus k times a k t. Then we have um, a mixed term, a minus k times a bar k plus another mixed term, a bar minus k times a k and finally plus a bar minus k a bar k plus now we do the same for the sine modes i times minus i is 1 we can get a factor of 1 half and now we get exactly the same but the signs of the uh, mixed terms will be different so 
so get a minus here and a minus here, which is convenient because it means that the mixed terms will cancel. And after making a bit of space, we can conclude that the Hamiltonian has the following form in our new variables. H is whatever we had for the zero mode before, plus the sum over all natural numbers k of a minus k of t times a k of t plus the same for the left movers, a minus k t a bar k t. We see that similar as we had for the complex sine and cosine modes, the energy of each of these modes, given that the reality conditions hold, is the squared norm of the complex valued variable a sub k or a bar sub k respectively. That is, if a sub minus k is the complex conjugate of a k and a bar minus k is the complex conjugate of a bar k for all natural numbers k then we can write our Hamiltonian in the following form it is the zero mode energy plus the sum over natural numbers k of absolute value of a k of t squared plus absolute value of a bar k t squared. Using the fact from complex numbers that a complex number times its complex conjugate is the same thing as the absolute value of the complex number squared. This nice result for the Hamiltonian is the motivation for choosing the normalization of the right moving and left moving modes as we had done before. So far we have just written down these definitions that I called right moving and left moving modes. And we have seen examples that hopefully make it plausible that these correspond to right moving and left moving waves actually. However, we have not yet shown mathematically that that is the case. We will now do that by plugging these definitions back into the Fourier expansion of our field. The calculation is easy but somewhat tedious, so if you want to skip it, just use the chapter marks. However, I recommend that you do such calculations at least once yourself. I have collected the inverses of all our variable definitions up here, from the left-right moving modes back to the complex valued cosine and sine modes and from these back to the rescaled Fourier modes and finally to the unscaled Fourier modes that we started out with. I have also calculated two combinations that we will need in a minute. These are very straightforward exercises of plugging in these definitions and just being careful about all the signs. Finally here I copied the Fourier expansion of our field in terms of the real valued Fourier modes and now we just need to plug in the inverse definitions. However, to make our life a little bit easier and to avoid having to use trigonometric identities for cosines and, and sines, we will first convert these cosines and sines to exponential functions. This is equal to the zero mode, which we for now will leave alone, plus a sum over the natural numbers, a cosine k 
kt and now we will express the cosine as e to the i times the argument kx 2 pi over l plus e to the negative argument over 2. This is just an identity between the exponential and cosine functions that you can easily derive from the identity we had the last time. Plus a times sine kt and we will express the sine in a similar way as e to the i kx 2 pi over l minus e to the minus i kx 2 pi over l over 2i. <clears throat> so let's clean this up a bit. We have the zero mode and then the sum. Sorry. Over natural numbers. And now we will combine the terms that have the positive exponential and the terms that have the negative exponentials. So in the end we get one half over a cosine k t. And here if we move the i upstairs we get minus i upstairs here. So we have minus i a sine k of t. Uh, this is the coefficient of e to the i kx 2 pi over l. And then we have a similar term for the negative exponential. So here we get a cosine k t. And here we have now minus i from moving the i upstairs uh, the minus cancels with this minus sign so in this case we have plus i a sine k of t this is the coefficient of e to the minus i kx 2 pi over l and you see that here now appeared as coefficients the combinations that I have already prepared and we can just plug them in so with zero mode plus and now there are some common factors which we can put outside of the sum so all of these terms uh, will have this factor in front i over the square root of 2tl. The factor that depends on k must remain inside this sum. So we will have this sum. Here we can now put the factor that uh, depends on k. That is 1 over k times 2 pi over l. And then we finally have here the um, a k of t minus a bar minus k of t being the co coefficient of e to the i k to pi over l. And for the negative exponential we have the same factors in front that we already dealt with and then we have a bar k of t minus a minus k of t being the exponent being the coefficient of the exponential e to the minus i kx 2 pi over l. I've copied over what we've got so far and now we will simplify this further by manipulating the negative indices. 
I will do this slowly, step by step, because if you're not used to these index manipulations, they can be a bit confusing and it's very easy to make sign mistakes. So let's rewrite this as two sums. In the first sum, we will only keep the terms with positive index k. And in the second sum, we will only keep the terms with negative index k. And so far it's clear that this is an identity because we have just split up the terms into two different sums over the natural numbers. And now what we will do is we will invert the sign of k in the second sum. So we will not sum over the positive integers, but we will sum over the negative integers, which we could write as minus k being in the natural numbers. And now let's invert k in um, all of this to get back to our original expression that we had with the positive index. So we will have minus k here. This will turn into plus k. We will have a minus from the k here. This will turn into plus k. And we will have a minus from the k here that turns this into plus this exponential, not this exponent. Okay, so we have um, exactly the same sum now, just is expressed by letting our index run over the negative integers. We will simplify it a bit further by removing the sign here by combining it with these minus signs. So let's change the sign here. And to keep all things equal, we change these signs of the coefficients here. And now we will recombine these sums, which will fit together quite nicely. So we have our common factor that's the same for both sums. And we will combine these two sums now in a sum over all non-zero integers. So we write k is in c without zero. <clears throat> the factor is the same in both sums, so we can just take it over here. And now let's see what we have for a sub k. a sub k is here multiplied by e to the plus i k x 2 pi over l and here also. So this term is actually the same in both of these sums. So we just write it down. And for a bar k we have a similar term that is also the same in both sums. but with the negative exponential. Now we have an expression for our field phi in terms of the newly defined mode variables, lowercase a sub k and lowercase a bar sub k. These mode variables are all functions of time. So let's now look at their behavior of time in terms of the classical dynamics that we talked about already the last time. If we combine the definitions of our new variables with the dynamics that we found last time, namely that the complex valued mode variables have a very simple dependence on time that can be expressed by these complex valued exponentials, these just uh, represent the circular motion in phase space. And if you plug these into the definitions of our new variables, you can find that also the new variables a sub k and a bar sub k have a 
time dependence of exactly the same form. These formulas hold for all natural numbers k with omega k defined as k times 2 pi over L. So let's plug this in. And we can see that the formulas for negative index k are exactly identical to the ones for positive k after simply replacing k by negative k. So we can actually state that for all k in the non-zero integers, we have that a k of t depends on time in the following way. It's a k at time zero times e to the minus i k t times 2 pi over l, where k can now be both positive and negative, and a time dependence of exactly the same form for the variables a bar. Let's insert the time dependence of the modes in our expression for the field. We can simplify these by combining the exponents. And what we get is here we have an exponent of minus i k times t minus x times 2 pi over l. And here we have an exponent of e to the minus i k t plus x times 2 pi over l. So we get the important result that we have one part that depends only on the combination t minus x which is the right moving part as we will convince us soon and one part that only depends on the con on the combination t plus x. This is the left moving part. What does it mean for a mathematical expression to depend only on t minus x, like this part here? To understand that, let's look at a space-time diagram. We have space on the horizontal axis and t on the vertical axis. So let's draw a line at constant t minus x. For example, we will have a line like this one. This is at constant t minus x equal to zero. We will have other lines of constant t minus x. For example, going like this, or like this. So if a function depends only on t minus x, it means that it has constant value along all of these parallel lines. And we see an example of such a function here, where the color encodes the function value. And if we now look at this, with passing time, we see that as time moves towards positive t, the function that we get on the time slice at the current time moves to the right with passing time. Analogously, if a function depends only on the combination t plus x, it corresponds to the following picture in space-time. lines of constant 
t plus x go like this. So this would be constant t plus x equal to zero. And we have other lines of constant t plus s t plus x parallel to this one. And a function that depends only on t plus x will be constant along all of these parallel lines. So here we see an example of a function that depends only on t plus x. And when we look at what this means with uh, a reference time moving towards positive t, we can immediately see why such a function is called a left moving function because the function values with respect to the uh, passing reference time move to the left. We can also see that both the left and the right moving modes propagate along lines that are at an angle of 45 degrees relative to the coordinate axis which means that they describe waves propagating by the speed of light. Because recall that we chose our units of measurements such that the speed of light is the dimensionless number one. Importantly, the speed of propagation is independent from which mode we are looking at. When we go through our different modes, we see that while the oscillation frequency of the mode rises proportionally with the mode number, the propagation speed of the left and right moving modes actually stays constant because the wavelength is reduced in inversely proportional to the mode number. There are two important physical quantities describing the velocity of wave propagation. The first is the phase velocity, and this is the velocity with which, for example, the crest of a wave moves. It is defined as the angular frequency of the oscillation over the wave number. And in our case, the angular frequency omega is k times 2 pi over l, and the wave number, which is defined as 2 pi times the number of complete waves per unit length, is also k times 2 pi over l, making the phase velocity a constant 1, which also corresponds to the speed of light in our units of measurement. <clears throat> the other important measure is the group velocity, that is the velocity with which localized wave packets propagate and also the velocity uh, with which you can send information using the wave. It is defined as the derivative of the angular frequency by the wave number. And in our case this is the derivative of k times 2 pi over l with respect to k times 2 pi over l, which is again a constant 1. The important fact that these velocities are independent from the mode number reflects that our quantum theory is a theory of massless particles, which all move exactly with the speed of light. If you like this video, please share and subscribe. And if you have any questions, just put them in the comments below. See you next time.